<coughs> yes, I was praying for my grandson. He was 20, and he had <coughs> drug-related psychosis uh, from marijuana, which made him have appalling hallucinations. And I was very aware when trying to get help for him that being a tall, mixed-race young man, there was no sympathy. I remember the psychiatrist saying in front of him, well, you've got a bad packet of genes, haven't you? I know. And he died under dreadful circumstances because he, there was no, there was an incident he was involved in. There was no locked ward for him to go back to because he had been before. And what had happened is they put him in uh, to once with jail for, 20, for 48 hours. And even though if he, they were warned that he was suicidal, somebody gave him back his shoelaces as training nurses. And he hanged himself. So it's an issue very, very close to my heart. And irrespective, for the moment, we are hearing a huge amount about suicide because Carl Sargent was a member of the Assembly. He was an important man. But we don't hear about the hundreds and hundreds of men who kill themselves all the time and are anonymous. And we all know that if it were women, there would be a public outcry and masses of funding. So you can imagine for all those families who've been touched, and it's actually quite frightening, because when you start talking to people, oh yes, it was my nephew, oh yes. So it touches so many people now. And again, there is no sense of outrage. But I want to talk about how I, in the, from the beginning of the refuge, understood that there is no such thing as a gendered violence. It never has been. And so that's the big lie that the truth of the matter is, and has always been, I knew in my own family, that both sides of my family, there are three generations of violence and alcoholics, and both my parents were dysfunctional and violence prone. Particularly my mother, she was physically very violent to me. So when I opened the refuge by accident, I was running a community centre, as many of you know, and the first woman came in who was bruised. I took her in because I knew I couldn't send her back and there was nowhere else for her to go, or anybody else at that point. Uh, but, almost immediately, I was very aware of the need for refuge for men. I think one of the first things that, that horrified me was uh, a, a man drove his car to the back of the refuge, where his wife was in the refuge, and he killed himself with carbon dioxide. And I just remember the young policeman coming to tell his wife, and I remember to this day, he said, you must sit down, I'll find a chair for you. She said, oh, thank God for that. And I just remember that moment thinking, and I just remember her thinking, at that point, I had to do something. So I managed to get a house in North London for a peppercorn rent from the GLC. But this is the shocking part, and this is something that's happening today. The millionaires, who are more than willing to put their hands in their pockets for women and children, would not give me a penny for a refuge for men. And nothing's changed, as you all know. There is no provision, virtually. Every so often somebody seriously tries, there's a couple of beds, mm -hmm. and then they go down for that law. Those of you who know Earl Silverman from Canada, he hanged himself in the end because he tried to keep his home open for men and refuge. And he really was naive enough to believe the Canadian government would listen to what he was saying and the numbers of men who asked him for help. And in the end, he took his own life up with a sense of absolute despair. And at the moment, is this a perilous time for people like me, who have sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons? What kind of a world am I, at 79, going to leave my children, and my, all of my children, or any of you? They're perilous times for men and boys. And there's... The, the, the frightening part of it is, anywhere you look, it's perilous. It's perilous in education. I was teaching children to read, and I chose to, to, to have boys, because boys find it harder. And all I can say, I, stuck, I stuck the year, because I had three boys, but it was child abuse towards the boys. Mostly, they were screamed at, and again, there were no men around. These were mostly teachers, desperate, trying to do their best. And what people don't seem to realize, and all of us know, that when boys getting to 9, 10, 11, 
They need male authority figures. They do not react to women's authority because quite naturally and biologically, they're pulling away from that feminine influence and turning outwards to, to, to find their own masculine identities, the other that they need. So I left that. And then re recently, from all the different kinds of abuses that, that have plagued my life and killed so many men, uh, is really false allegations which is exactly the situation that killed Carl Sargent. And the fact that he can be sacked, he's lost his, 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 the whole of his life's work. It doesn't matter people saying, oh, well, <coughs> as they've said to me, oh, well, he must, be, he must be guilty, that's why he did it. No, any man who knows that there are accusations against him knows he will probably lose his job. If he has children, he has to move out of his house. This is only allegations, no evidence. Has to move out of his house. And it'll take over a year before there'll be any kind of a court case. Now, what people don't know is that the woman, and it's 99.9%, .9 it's women who are making these allegations. These women get paid. The Criminal Compensation Board, from the moment she makes the allegation, with no evidence, can hand out up to half a million in compensation, depending on what the, the, the extent of the, of the so-called allegation. Taxpayers are paying this, and if she then, he then is acquitted, they keep the money. And the police will help you fill in the form. This is a matter of fact, not fiction. And it's been going on for a long, long time. The only reason that it's all come into common ground now is because this man in the Welsh Assembly hanged himself. And I am hoping that his family will do what I did when Keita died. I took the Home Office right the way through the entire court system in England and then to Brussels. And my, and my wish is that it's going to take, we men have to start suing. No one is going to listen until they do. Because they, what they do, they play the paper trail with you. Letters, memos, yes assertions, texts, anything. But they do not actually take any action. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Mark um, Pearson's case. He was going home completely innocent, Waterloo Station. Did any of you see that case? Yeah. Yep. There was next morning, police outside. You've been accused of, of abusing this woman on the platform. The actual details of the abuse are so gross, they're not physically possible. The, a judge told the CPS that they should give the case up. CPS insisted. Now, why would the CPS insist when the actual CTV cameras showed that he didn't touch her? He walked straight past her. Why would they do that? Well, 63% of the staff of the Crown Prosecution Service are women. Alison Saunders is a very well-known radical feminist. And I'll bet my bottom dollar, so are the other 62 women. And it's open season on men. And I think, and, and people aren't coming out and being honest, because what tends to happen, once it's like being drummed out of the brownies. I was a feminist for about five minutes when I realized it was nothing to do with equity feminist. It was a Marxist movement, and it was a, a movement designed to raise money. It was never about women's issues. And what happened, it started in, in America, and I remember it coming over here. And I remember the early, collectives that we all had to go and join you, you you went to your house you created a collective and then you then we were all told that our problem was our husbands it was just good old-fashioned communist brainwashing actually which i knew a lot about because my parents had been captured by communists we didn't see them for three years now what's happened it's 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 huge it's a billion dollar industry 300 million a year goes to refuge and women's aid and women's aid, Welsh women's aid are one of the most vociferous groups, anti-men, violently anti-men, and will actually act against all fathers' interests. And the problem is the judiciary has been usurped by feminist training methods because feminists do all the training right the way through almost everything in this country that happens. And for those of you who have ever had to come across the Duluth model, that is one of the most dangerous things that you can be forced to do by Kafka, social workers, and a judge. And if you are forced onto one of their, their, uh, their programs, one of the first things you have to do is to apologize for your male privileges. How can?
the government fund such an openly obvious political ideology. We have to get, we, we get spent on details because the stories that are happening are so horrifying. But we do have to get to the nub of the problem. This, I've always called it the evil empire. And until we actually start dismantling the funding, we're never going to get anywhere because it's self-perpetuating. And tonight, and in everywhere, hopefully, we are discussing the fact that men are dying, and they're dying from this condition. And the condition they're dying from is being hated, being discriminated against. In a sense, if you look at the figures of men who lose their homes, their families, their children, and most of them, 90% of those homeless men are there as a result of domestic violence. They've been kicked out, they've been lost. And those are the ones that have survived just. If we look at that, I, I think it's a form of genocide. I really do. I, I can't see anywhere in history when, when women have turned on men like this, men as the, who are the, protect, the protectors, the, 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 it's, it, men who, who are out working, 75% of taxes are paid by men who are there and they are working to, for their wives, their children and their families. And I just think the time has come to get down to brass tax and no longer be afraid. Of course you're afraid. I had all my books that I've ever written pulped and I lost my income. I'm on income support and I live in one room. It doesn't matter. The only thing I own in life is a very old car. But you have to, at some point, stand up and be counted. It's too easy just to be horrified, upset, moved. We need action and we need action from men. And I have noticed over the years, more and more men are taking action and speaking out. And I salute them because I know what they have to lose. I think my 15 minutes is up. Okay. Thanks, Annie.